in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul is now going to be addressing some of the things that he was asked to address earlier there in chapter 2 at Chloe's house, at the household of Chloe and so forth, when they were concerned about the things that the enemy had used to creep into the church. They wanted direction on how to deal with the issues of everyday people's lives. Now, before we get into the text, I want to just bring a little background to the church of Corinth for you a little bit to a degree. When I was a little kid growing up, we used to watch the old pirate movies and all these types of other shows, the barbaric movies. And they would always have the Corinthian girls where they would the ship would land in and they would go to Corinth and they would have the Corinthian girls and the Corinthian people and they were always drunk and partying and stuff like that. That's pretty much how Corinth really was in that day that Paul is talking right now. <clears throat> the church really in Corinth was really uh, in, 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 it was in it was in trouble. It was full of their own cliques that I'm a Paul, I'm a Papalus, I'm a Peter. They were still babies, they were still carnal. They were suing each other in worldly courts as brothers and sisters in the Lord. It was a mess, pretty much. And so the purpose of writing this letter from Paul was to answer the, the questions they had on how to deal with with the things that were going on in the church there at Corinth. And so in chapter 7 is where Paul starts to respond to some of the issues. Now, remember, Corinth was nothing more than a true pagan city. Um, <clears throat> on the Acropolis above Corinth, there was a temple of Aphrodite. And the temple priestess and the, the prostitutes would come down in the cool part of the day in the evening to wear their, you know, their clothes, you know, low graded, and, and they would be there to seduce and entice the people to come in and give them their monies. And they would go back and they would give their monies to the priestess, the goddesses, and so forth. And that's how they would keep the temple going there in Corinth. Now it is interesting to me that how much Satan is always an imitator, is a deceiver, constantly. When you remember going back into the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve when God came down in the cool part of the day to fellowship with them every day. Making them, making Adam out of, he formed him out of the dust or out of the, the ground, the earth here. It's interesting to me that as he became a spiritual being, a spirit, mind, and body, as God is a spirit, those that worship him, spirit, and, worship him in spirit and in truth, we know that in the beginning God hovered over the face of the deep, and the spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. Okay? And we know that those that worship him connect to him in the spirit, obviously. But what's interesting to me this angelic being that chose one day to no longer adhere to the authority of God in heaven, Lucifer, he chose to rebel, and when he did, from that point on, he chose to go against anything or anybody pertaining to the things of God. Those that were created in the image of God, which was us, those and or anything else that was made by God, he's seeking out to destroy. It's obvious. Now, Corinth, in the middle of all of this, pagan things that were going on, the sexual morality, the carnality, in the middle of all of it is where God sat there and encouraged Paul, and he told Paul that he had many people still in the middle of this city, despite of what the people were doing still here in this wicked city. Corinth had a lot of things that they were opening themselves up to that weren't sound doctrine. And they started to allow the prince of the air, the prince of this world, the god of this world, Satan, 
to fill their ears and their minds with the junk of the world. And it started to creep into the church. Remember Paul earlier was talking to the church of Rome in chapter 1. And he said there in verse 11, that I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so you may be established or so that you may be able to become stable or firm. You won't be moved. Now in this day, the church here at Corinth was surrounded with sexual temptation like we are today. Now, I don't know about you, but everywhere I go, I have sexual temptation everywhere. And it's creeping in more and more to our society, to our families, everywhere we go. But I want to share a little story before we get into the actual chapter 7, because I'm going to move through chapter 7 very quickly, actually, tonight. It will surprise you. You guys remember the story of Joseph, when Joseph was sold out for just a couple of bucks by his own brothers. They put him in a pit, left him there, took the 20 bucks. The other guys came, took him to Egypt, was sold out, became a slave, lived in the dungeon for many, many years. But yet God's hand was upon him while he was learning a foreign language, while he was learning to live in a new culture. While he was learning how to, he was having to learn how to do anything with life. The Bible says that God's hand was upon him because he was having to lean on God so much for where he was. Now, I want to just kind of draw something in here to, so that you know what it was like then, where Paul's writing, and where we are today. God says in the Bible that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when Joseph, back in the beginning of Genesis, went down to Egypt, I'm sure throughout many of those years, he started to ponder, started to think, that am I ever going to get out of this place? Will anything ever change for me because I don't see it happening? And I've been crying out to the Lord for a long time. But yet sexual temptation was on Joseph through Potiphar's wife that would come and haggle with him every day as he was being able to be an entrusted prisoner. And he would be able to go into the house and Potiphar's wife would be sitting there enticing him to go to bed with her every day, the Bible says. And finally one day, she just got in his face and she just said, lie with me, let's go, you know, let's hunker down. And he said, I can't do this thing to you, to me, your husband. I can't do this thing against the Lord. And he turned and she took a portion of his robe, his garment, and tore it as he turned to leave. He was fleeing his youthful lust. He was no different like you and me waking up in the morning. This men were all adults here. Okay? Sometimes we make the wrong decisions. Sometimes, you know, it's real life. But he chose to flee that youthful lust at a very tough time. And as he did... It got worse for him for a while because she started pointing the finger and it's Joseph and there was some bad stuff going around the kingdom, the palace, the land about Joseph. And no doubt, I would think, for me, looking at this young man's life, that's no longer a young man anymore. He's a middle-aged man. And he's starting to go, God, where are you? I don't get it. Why does it have to be this long? Why does it have to be this hard? I don't want to go out here and cry again because of the labor that they're putting me through anymore today by myself. Where are you? I'm here to tell you tonight that God was there all the way. He 
He had a plan. Was it stretching? Yep. Was it trying? Absolutely. It was the best thing for Joseph, and he didn't get it, though, until quite a ways <coughs> down the way. Now, as we get into chapter 7 here, Paul says, Now concerning the things in which you guys wrote to me, that is in chapter 2, Chloe's household, when they're getting there together, apparently they made contact with Paul, and as he gets into the household, they're bringing all these issues of what was happening in the church. Adultery, fornication, things that none of us have ever done here today, right? Things we don't deal with anymore, right? He said, <coughs> he said, uh, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual morality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Society back then was tough like it is today. Okay? It was tough. But what Paul's saying, he's saying, because of the sexual immorality, the weakness of our flesh, if you desire a woman, okay, start basically praying for her now. If you're going to go out here and take your, your pick through MrLove.com on TV, <laughs> you may end up with it, but it may not be what you wish you ended up with. Okay? I would rather wait upon the Lord in my prayer closet and let Him supernaturally have someone bump into me that is just going to be a perfect attraction with the personality, the physical, the spiritual, everything's there. We just know that it's a God thing. Rather than me going out here and tasting all of the goods beforehand thinking that that's going to work out for me because I can tell you right now after all these years, it doesn't. Okay? It doesn't. Paul sits here in verse 4, or verse 3. He says, Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Now, I've always liked that verse for me. I've always told my wife, Hey, remember that? That's it. She says, Yeah, but keep reading it. You know? <laughs> it's like, No, I want to stop right there. You know? And it says, and likewise, the husband does not have authority over his, uh, his own body, but the wife does. You see, your wife has a period. You guys know that? Impurities of the body, of, the, of God created it to have children and reproduce and all of the above. There's a time when you don't touch your wife. But he's also talking about a time that you guys know that you need to hunker down in your prayer life. There's a time when you got to get serious in your walk with God. There's no more games. Life is now tough. I need you. 